You be seated. Well, good morning. I was uh, in a snowball fight last night, and <clears throat> I was on the uh, the kids' team, and uh, Tyson, just as I looked up, hit right in the eye. So, so with this eye, I like see three lights. So, so it's kind of cool. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it'll get better but but i noticed last week in the bulletin it was still 2021 uh the good old days um but you know along with the board meeting is following the potluck last week but i i guess i guess it was right because it's still following the potluck just seven days later uh so no potluck today it was just seven days ago but the board meeting's following it today all right so but uh, let, let's turn to Luke 3. You know, I've been trying to follow a timeline through the Bible. And today marks, today marks 18 years since I first arrived here. We left, we left the deserts of California, you know, the balmy weather of California, and we were welcomed to 20 below zero that day, Eight, 18 years ago. Uh, we didn't even have coats uh, that were warm enough. It was crazy. But uh, anyways, I started in Genesis, and I got sidetracked a few times, but, you know, sometimes I forget what I preached, you know, and, uh, and it's easy to keep track because, okay, yeah, I just left off, you just keep go to the bookmark and just keep going through. So, so now we're in the New Testament, finally, right? And, uh, you know, so, but now we're in the Gospels, and uh, it could get a little repetitive, uh, Matthew, Mark, John, you know, repeat, uh, repeat and repeat. But this is some simple processing going on. Simple processing going on. You know, Luke wrote an accurate account that transpired. Luke was a doctor, and he liked the stats. So starting from Luke 3, starting with verse 1, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod the Tartarch, of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Euteria, and Traconitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Albine. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John of Zechariah in the desert. And I was reading uh, Wiersbe's comment on this. Luke named seven different men, including a Roman emperor, a governor, three tetrarchs, rulers over the fourth part of the area, and two Jewish high priests. But God's word was not sent to any of them. Instead, the message of God came to John the Baptist, a humble Jewish prophet. You know, God has a way of using the lowly and leveling out the high and mighty. The ones that seem to know everything will be laid low. In verse 3, It says, John, he went into the country around Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Um, Please keep your place here and turn to 2 Kings 5.8. You know, who told John to baptize? You know, there there were some ceremonial washings that took place for the priests uh, so that they would be clean before they performed their religious duties. The Essenes... You can look up some of their writings along the Dead Sea Scrolls. They had, they had some ritual washings that were part of their rituals in their, in their um, culture. There were other purification rites to do after they become unclean, um, like touching a dead person, an unclean person, or, or having a discharge or an emission. John the Baptist wasn't doing a purification or a cleansing washing. John's baptism wasn't water from jars or done with water sprinkled with the ashes of a red heifer. John baptized in a river, Jordan, for repentance. And I was uh, looking at, uh, thinking about John the Baptist and thinking about uh, Forrest Gump, you know. I just felt like running, right? Well, hey, why, why did John baptize? Did you just feel like baptizing? John came in the spirit of Elijah. There was another one that had a double portion of Elijah's Elijah's spirit, and he sent someone to the Jordan to wash in its water. In in 2 Kings 5, 8, 
When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, okay? Uh, first, this, this, this guy, Naaman, he went to, uh, to the king because he was told, hey, you can, you can get healed of your leprosy in Israel. And so Naaman, he goes, oh man, I got to go to the top dog. And he goes to the top dog and, and uh, the king, he rips his robes. He says, what am I? I can't heal you. And he couldn't. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the men come to me. And he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and he went off in a rage. You know, Naaman was a powerful man and he wanted a powerful act of healing. I mean, Elisha, he knocks on Elisha's door and, and Elisha doesn't even answer it. Elisha doesn't even meet him. He sends out his messenger. Oh, go tell him to wash in the river seven times. You know, that'll be good. You know, the cure was too simple. It was too, ah, can't, can't be true. What's he, what's he going to mock me? But anyways, in verse 13, Naaman's servants went to him and said, and, he, and again, another servant, the lowly guy, says to him, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more when he tells you, watch and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored, and he became clean like that of a young boy. Let's, let's turn to, back to Luke 4.25, please. You know, Naaman was a Gentile. Uh, John alerted people of their sin, you know, in the spirit of Elijah. Uh, and, and, and sin was like leprosy. Um, it was contagious. Naaman knew he had it. And he went to the king first to hope for a cure. The king just ripped his robes. Kind of like the wise men when they came to, to Jerusalem to look for the king. They went to the king. But then they were told to go to Bethlehem, lowly Bethlehem. Um, then comes Elisha. And, you know, he's probably dressed kind of like John the Baptist in camel's clothes with a leather belt or whatever. Um, I know Elijah uh, definitely was dressed in, in those, those types of clothes. But anyways, he, he, he goes and sends a messenger. Go wash. Dip yourself seven times. And be cleansed. Simple. You know, Naaman recognized he had leprosy. You know, that's the first thing. To, to knowing, to, to getting healed, is knowing we're sick. Recognizing sin is a good start. But there's a simple follow-up for the cure. John was crying out to all Israel. But he was resonating with the sinners, the tax collectors, and even the Roman soldiers. Israel's elite were withdrawn. They were, they were, they were picking on John. Hey, what, what, what in the world's going on here? Why are you people following him? Why are you guys gathering and, and, and into this desert on the Jordan? Are you just going there to see a reed swaying in the wind? I mean, that's, that's all this John is. I mean, this cold... He, I mean, he, he eats grubs and worms and huh, locusts and wild honey and... and yeah... Why are you going and listening to this guy? You know, these, these leaders, they were the, supposed to be the ones with the cure. But they didn't recognize they had a disease. They may have well as ripped their clothes like that king did. You know, so many times people go to the experts. You know, certainly the educated, powerful, elite, and popular ones should know the answers. They don't even know, recognize the source of the disease. The answer is not in a physical vaccine, isolation, burning, poisoning, cutting, or chemically, genetically, technologically altering methods. The philosophers of this age see the symptoms, but not the cause. 
You know, pleasure, power, and wealth are also vain ways to, to try to, to, to push away and, and, and suppress the symptoms of sin. And we try to mask it. You know, maybe, you know, this, this, this life has something more in it than, than, than just suffering. You know, and we, we join in the pleasure and power. And, and that stuff just sucks it right out of you. It just makes it worse. And, you know, people, they, they, they want to be more immortal. But they're, pri- they're trying to prolong the disease of death instead of, you know, are, are you following me? John didn't fit in with the religious trend, traditions and rituals. John wasn't marketable. Business was not benefiting from this wild man dressed in camel's hair and baptizing people to repentance by the river of Jordan. John pointed out sin and prepared the way for the cure through repentance. There was, there was nothing big about it. It wasn't costing anybody anything. God's message was simple. And he used a lowly man to get the eternal message across. You know, John wasn't leaving out the religious or the educated people uh, from, and the powerful elite. You know, he called on them to repent too. And, and he, he really got into them. He, he, he got their attention. You brood of vipers. Right? Who warned you to flee the coming wrath? They just didn't want to. They were enslaved, enslaved. I know, you know what slavery is. Everybody does slavery to sin. Right? Still we go on doing it and find that empty road. Sometimes we just got to get it in here and in here and understand, hey, we got to, we got to stop this. And, and, you know, that chain. Why am I doing this? And, and, and repent. That's the start. John says, repent. Jesus remarked about the trend and almost was thrown from the cliff. You know, there were seven elite men mentioned from the religious, judicial, and government at the beginning of Luke 3. But it was a lowly, common-named, grub-eating, honey-eating, camel-wearing John the Baptist that God sent to baptize to repentance. It was a lowly, common-named, grub-honey-eating, camel-hair-wearing John the Baptist that God sent to prepare the way for the Lord. The elite had an issue with the Lord as well. In, in Luke 4, 25, it says, I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. And they got up, drove him out of town, and took him to the brow of a hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. This is Jesus. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Let's turn to John 1, 32, please. You know, Na- Naaman was a Gentile. You know, even though the Old Testament constantly expresses that the nations would know. You know, all the nations would be blessed through Israel. A lot of times Israel thought, hey, we are the chosen ones. And, and, and wow, you know, they got ticked off when, when a Gentile was put on equal platform as the Jews. And they were going to throw Jesus off the cliff. When, when, when Paul... Was, was entering the synagogue, you know, they, they, their accusation was he brought in Gentiles with them and they were about to kill him. And then, then Paul says, you know, he finally quiets them down. And he says, no, 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 no. 
I didn't bring any Gentiles in. I'm, I'm doing the Jewish law ordinances, man. Can you see? I've, I'm, I've shaved and, and I have fasted. I've done all the preparation work. And he's talking to them. And then, and then he says, he talks about his vision with, with Jesus. And then he says, I was sent to the Gentiles. And then all of a sudden, the rage, the Israelites, they were going to kill him. In fact, 40 men conspired that they were vowed that they would not eat until they killed this man. Elijah was sent to Naaman, or Elijah sent a messenger to Naaman to tell him to wash in the Jordan to be cleansed of leprosy. You know, Elisha had the double spirit of Elijah, and John the Baptist had the spirit of Elijah. You know, this, this must tie in somehow, right, to where this baptism of repentance came about. You know, like I said, there's some ceremonial cleansing in the Bible, but John was doing something different. John was sent to baptize with water by someone. He didn't baptize just because it was tradition. You know, John didn't study the Levitical code and traditions and then come up with his idea. You know, I'm going to go to the Jordan. I'm going to start this baptism thing. You know, or, or, or like Forrest Gump, you know, I just felt like baptizing. John was sent to baptize with water by someone. In John 1, 32, Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me. The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. Please let's turn to John 3, 26. You know, John's ministry took a downturn, a huge downturn after this. This was the mission of John. John. This is what he was put on earth for. I mean, he was born. He was there to prepare the way for the Lord and, and, and to present him and baptize on repentance. And then, Jesus. He baptized Jesus. And the cloud rolled in and the, the spirit like a dove rested on Jesus. And the cloud, out of the voice, says, cloud, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And, and, and that was... That was the pivotal. That was the top of John's game. And then after that, it was downhill from there, at least in the world, in the eyes of the world. John pointed to the cause of all the sickness, wars, starvations, accidents, storms, discord, and evil. It was sin. And a genuine repentance from following our self-interests, self-worship, self-seeking. And it, this was the beginning of the cure, of the course for the cure. It wasn't greenhouse gases. <laughs> it was sin. John was sent to baptize with water by someone. And when he did, he would see the Spirit come down. And he would baptize. Jesus would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. You know, repentance was important, but it was just the preparation to Jesus the Redeemer. And then Jesus would bring new life to our dead way by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In John 3, 26, they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, well, he is baptizing, and everyone is going to him. To this John replied, A man can receive only what is given to him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Christ, but I am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine. And now... It is now complete. He must become greater, and I must become less. The one who comes from above is above all, and the one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. 
He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. The man who has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in His hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on Him. Uh, let's, let's turn back to uh, Luke 3, 4. We must become less. You know, Luke 3 starts out with a list of the top dogs of the area during Jesus, during John the Baptist. But lowly John is the one that prepared the way for Jesus. You know, I couldn't figure out who it was that, that sent John the Baptist, you know, it, it, through the Bible. It, it doesn't really say, you know, it could have been Gabriel. You know, Gabriel was just hanging out pretty good. Um, could have been the Holy Spirit. Uh, could, have been, could have been Jesus. Maybe it was his dad, Zachariah. Someone sent John to baptize with water to repentance. Out of all the powerful elite mentioned at the start of the chapter, God sent this grub and honey eating, camel hairy, wearing, desert wandering, lowly man baptizing to repentance in the spirit of Elijah by the Jordan. He was the one with the answer. In Luke 3, starting with verse 4, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in and every mountain and hill made low. The crooked road shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all mankind will see God's salvation. God said to the crowds coming out, John, John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Please keep your place here and we'll turn to Isaiah 2, 9. The high will be brought low. The crooked will become straight. The rough will be made smooth. You know, John's, John's mentioning mountains and, and roads and physical objects, but then he points to people. Who warned you? You brood of vipers. And I think he's pointing to something like the list at the beginning of the chapter. Man with all his knowledge gets puffed up, but the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. You know, we, we, could, we could look at, look at all the things that, that man has, you know, and, and the high things, but you know what? They're going to they're gonna dissipate. They're going to be made low. And the word of God's going to trumpet. This physical universe with all its chemical and atomic compounds is amazing, but it's just temporary. It's, a, it's just a temporary shadow of the eternal. And God's wisdom looks foolish to man, but when God's wisdom is revealed in, in, in Isaiah 2, 9, so man will be brought low and mankind humbled. Do not forgive them. Go into the rocks, hide in the ground, from the dread of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty. The eyes of the arrogant man will be humbled and the pride of man brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. The Lord Almighty has a day in store for all the proud and lofty, for all that is exalted, and they will be humbled. And then he, then he talks about the physical things, but it, they're just, a, they're just a, a paradigm or a parable of of what is going to happen to the high and mighty. For all the cedars of Lebanon, tall and lofty, and all the oaks of Bashan, for all the towering mountains and the, all the high hills, for every lofty tower and every fortified wall, for every trading ship and every stately vessel, the arrogance of man will be brought low and the pride of man humbled. For the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Please, let's turn back to Luke 3, 7. John said to the crowd, coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? In verse 8, it says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. 
The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. You know, John pointed out the cause of every evil, and he baptized to repentance to to prepare the way for the Lord. He also pointed to the fruit of repentance. And what happens to those who don't bear fruit? In verse 10, he says, says, what should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, the man who has two tunics should share with the one who has none. And the one who has food should do the same. Tax collectors also came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than what you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and preached the good news to them. But when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done, Herod added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven opened up, and the Holy Spirit descended on him bodily in form like a dove. And the voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you, I'm well pleased. This was John's mission. Here it is. To see and to prepare the way for Jesus. You know, and, and as we live our lives, it's so easy to get enamored with the physical. To, to be in awe of the physical, to be in fear for the physical, to think about, you know, the material things, my flesh, my, my health, my life, my death. When is it going to be over? It's going to be over. This flesh is. But there's something that's not going to be over. And that's what John was preparing the way for, Jesus. And when we trust in him, and we repent, we, 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 we turn away, we, we say, hey, I'm not going to serve this flesh anymore. I'm not going to be self-centered. I, I, I'm going to be made new. Because I was made for much more than this. Not this corroded life of flesh and you know, stuff that's going to dissipate and be gone. I was created for God. And the thing is, this God can come into me with the Holy Spirit and give me a new life to serve the living God, not this corrupting, decaying life. We have something more to serve. And this is great news. But at the same time, the people of this world reject it. Please don't reject it. God has a way of baptizing you with the Holy Spirit and with fire to give you the fruits in keeping with repentance. This was John's mission to prepare the way of the Lord. Soon his followers deserted him, John's followers, and followed Jesus. Soon he was put into prison and and beheaded. But he rejoiced to see his bridegroom. And soon he entered into eternity. And he got front row seats to when Jesus, yeah, Jesus was beat with the sticks and and whips and, and hung and crucified and he was laid in a tomb. But he was got front row seats. To when Jesus says, okay, death, you're conquered. Sin, your sting is gone. And he was the first resurrected. And we are the ones to follow, those that have trusted in him. Let's let's pray. Lord God, we just thank you so much for 
your word. Lord God, <laughs> it's so simple. And we try to complicate it. We try to, we try to justify whatever it is that, 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 that keeps us bound, that keeps us enslaved to our sinful passions and desires. Lord, I pray that we in turn, we can turn from our passions. We can repent and receive these new desires, these desires that can actually be filled. Not these repent from these broken cisterns that can't hold water, but return to the fountain of life that will never dry out, that will always satisfy. Lord God,